even if it's uncomfortable, there's going to be so many positives. Like the people I met back in the UK, they are like family. And even though there is uncomfortable situations and that kind of stands out, there are so many positives to all of these experiences as well. Welcome to the Venturette Podcast, where women from all over the world share their stories of travel, moving abroad, and creating a new life for themselves, hoping to inspire you to live out your dreams by showing you how other women did it. I'm your host, Venturette Ashley. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Venture Podcast. I'm Ashley, and I am so grateful to have you here with me today. It truly means so much. I love sharing these stories with you all, and I'm enjoying these stories so much, and I hope you are enjoying them too. With today's guest, she's originally from Canada, and she grew up in a small town. And by the time she finished her education, she started to look at the different options of what kind of life she could have if she would to stay there. And she didn't like any of those options. So she decided that she wanted to do something a little bit different, and that was to teach abroad. She eventually landed a job in the UK where you might think, oh, that must have been a really easy transition. There's no language barrier, you know, no real culture shock. Well, you know, that is, you know, a bit of the case. But in the job that she ended up taking there, that was a bit of a different story. Her students initially rejected her as they felt that she would be someone that wouldn't stay for very long and just didn't respect her at all. The work environment that she was in was quite negative. And even though it was quite difficult and she did have the option to leave, she decided to stick it out. She had a two-year contract and she didn't want to be just another teacher that just kind of stays for a few weeks or a few months and goes, but she really wanted to really be there for her students. And so while she did experience a lot of, you know, discomfort and a lot of different obstacles, she, in the end, finished her contract. And even though by the end, it wasn't completely perfect and there were still a few issues, she really just looked more at the bigger picture and that one, she really wanted to finish this for herself, but also finish this contract for her students and show them that, you know, people really do show up and will continue to be there. Though, unfortunately, after her contract, they did not renew it with her. And so she was forced to leave. And now she is living in Hanoi, Vietnam. And while she's living in a completely different part of the world, and it's a very different culture, she is because of her past experiences, especially in the UK, that has really helped give her the confidence to really just accomplish anything, no matter what the obstacle is, no matter where in the world. So today I'm really happy to have Trisha here on the show and share with us her story as to how she made this life for herself happen and how she was able to push through all the obstacles and the discomfort that she has faced to get to where she is now. So I am so pleased to welcome Trisha. Hi, Trisha. Hi. So right now you are in Hanoi, Vietnam. So um, how long have you been there now? Um, I've been here around 10 months now. I moved here the end of last July for a job. Okay. And this is the first country you've moved abroad to. Is that correct? No, actually, I lived in the UK for two years. So I'm originally from Southern Ontario. So uh, right near the Great Lakes, about three hours from Toronto. That's where I grew up. Okay. And how was, you know, life growing up in Canada? Like, I've only been to Quebec, but I've heard, you know, Canada, you know, is beautiful, is well known for like, it's, you know, nice landscapes, but also that it's very cold. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it can be very cold. Um, I grew up in like rural Canada. Canada like the nearest neighbor was a good mile away so I grew up with all the pig farms and cow farms and like the coyotes and wolves and stuff like that so it was it was really interesting growing up because I I was just really independent I grew up with a single mother so just getting out and kind of exploring and doing my own thing Um, but yeah, it does get very hot in the summer and very cold in the winter. Um, I'm used to like blizzards and snow above my kneecaps and stuff like that. 
Uh, so when you moved to the UK, I'm sure you were like, oh, this this is nothing because, you know, they say the UK is cold, which it is, but I'm sure it's still nothing like Canada. Well, they say it's cold and like you do kind of um, acclimatize to the temperature. But even I remember we had a snow day and I looked outside and there was barely a covering of snow on the ground. I was like, what? Everything shut down. So I was sending photos to like my family. And they were just laughing so hard. Yeah, that, that's the thing when like, even whether you move abroad to like another country or even another part of the same country, it's just kind of funny what people think is like a real snowstorm or a rainstorm or, you know, whatever it is. But yeah, I know that for here in Portland, um, like two inches, people lose their minds, um, <laughs> which I know for you would be nothing. But, you know, you grew up, you said like on the farms and everything in Canada. So, I mean, were you exposed to a lot of travel when you were growing up? Was that a big thing? Oh, no, not at all. So growing up, um, I grew up fairly poor. My mom worked so hard to support us. But we had like a family trip maybe once a year. And it was usually like a couple of days in Niagara Falls. And I remember the one trip she took us on, um, we went to like the Butterfly Conservatory and we went on the Maid of the Mist and all that kind of stuff. Um, and under the falls. And that was kind of the big trip. Like we didn't really travel at all. Like abroad was not a thing that we had access to. So everything that I kind of wanted to see, I, I lived at the library. I lived there. Um, so I was constantly researching like the Mayan ruins and Egyptian hieroglyphics. And I just wanted to see all of these things for myself, but it was never a reality growing up. It was never something that was achievable. Mm -hmm. So you were, you know, exploring, but like you said, like, you know, through books and stuff. So, I mean, when you were doing like all these, um, well, when you were doing your yearly trips with your family, where exactly would you go like, with your family? So usually it was like Niagara Falls, because that was the big kind of draw. It's only like two and a half, three hours away. It's kind of like up near Toronto, like on the way there. Um, my mom was afraid of like bigger cities. So we would do like shopping trips into London, for example, which is only a, an hour away. But it was just all kinds of like little trips. It was like going to Godbridge and going to Niagara Falls and just little things that we could do as a family, but nothing very like big and extravagant. Mm -hmm. And even though like, you know, they weren't big or extravagant, I would assume that it was still really fun for you at the time because, you know, you were a lot younger and you were still getting to explore different parts of your country. But I mean, when you were younger, since you were exploring and reading all these books, was that something that you were already aspiring to do when you were like older to like go and travel? Uh, in my head, no, but I think subconsciously, yes. Because I just wanted to see all these things for myself. Like, I was just so into everything. I love to learn. So I was studying, like, art. And I was studying history and architecture and just, like, ancient history. And I, I just wanted to go out and see the world. But I come from such a small town and small town mentality. It was basically, like, you went to high school. A lot of people got pregnant just out of high school or even in high school. You married your high school sweetheart. You maybe went to college, you had like a job as like a nurse or a teacher or like just very small town vibes. And I kind of was the black sheep and I wanted to break out of that. So that was kind of seen as like, oh, what is she doing? But I, I just wanted so badly to see everything. Mm -hmm. So no, and I totally get that, you know, like I was the same as well, you know, growing up and, you know, it wasn't me through books, but it was more so through like traveling shows. I was like inspired just by seeing that, you know, on the TV that I was like, I want to see that in real life. So even though you didn't see it as something tangible, like you said, it was something that was kind of subconscious always in the back of your mind. So, I mean, you finished high school, so I'm assuming you still, you know, went to college, you know, and got your degree. So what did you end up studying? What was your plan at the time while you were still in Canada? So when I was in high school, that's kind of when the travel bug hit me because um, there was more opportunities for me to go somewhere. But I was always told kind of growing up, you're going to go to university, you're going to get a job that you can do in the daytime, uh, where you can like support a family if you so choose. And um, you're going to make your own money. So I started working actually at the age of 12. I held three jobs when I was 12. And 
I just, I had to do that on my own because it was basically like, if I don't do this for myself, it's not going to happen. So I remember being in grade 10 and I took uh, French throughout high school as well because I originally wanted to do a minor in French. Um, So I was given the opportunity to go to Saint Thomas for a ski trip with like the school. And I just wanted to do it so badly. So I managed to convince my mom (laughs) to let me go. And I figured out the money on my own. And I ended up going. And that's kind of where it all started. Um, But that was the only trip I really did in high school. But at the end of high school, like throughout it, um, I always wanted to go on like exchange trips and stuff like that. But it was always my mom said, we're too far away. We don't have the money to support it. I don't feel comfortable having somebody else in the house. Like we were in a very old farmhouse. It was very isolated. So I understood where she was coming from. And finally, I just, I got myself so riled up that um, my father actually stepped up and he said, you know what, I'll do this for you. I will take in the exchange student. So I ended up uh, getting an exchange to Quebec for the summer. So when I graduated, it was kind of like the cutoff time because my birthday was later. Um, They wouldn't take anyone over 18. So I was 17 at the time and I went to Quebec for the summer and I stayed with a family in saint jean sur richelieu just outside of Montreal. And that's it it kind of fed into it because I was like, okay, I'm out on my own. Um, I'm doing stuff. I'm like exploring uh, Quebec with these people. And it it was a great organization. Honestly, it was such a great um, experience for me to have. And then I moved back home. And two weeks later, I went to university. I can imagine. And so it's very interesting that, you know, you did an exchange program because, you know, I've gotten to live with a host family abroad as well. That was when I first moved abroad. And, you know, it's it's definitely very different compared to just moving a place on your own because it's like you're a part of this family, you know, a part of this new culture, like you're fully just, you know, in it. So how was it adjusting to living with another family in Quebec? I honestly loved it. I Throughout my travels and throughout like moving abroad, I've kind of found that I adjust quite quickly. So I kind of just throw myself into a situation and go, okay, we're going to deal with it. And I don't give myself a chance to back out or kind of be afraid. I just completely throw myself into it, which has worked for me so far, but it's, it's been a little, um, a little much at times, but getting to this host family, they were the nicest people ever. And um, I just remember walking in the house and they were talking so fast in French. And I just had to tell them like, you need to slow down. I'm trying really hard, but I can't keep up. But at the end of it, like they were talking at a normal pace and I was able to keep up with everything. And to this day, even though I didn't actually get a minor in French, that got a little messed up along the way. um, I can still understand it. I can still read it. And I still like kind of using it. And even learning Vietnamese now, all of my French keeps coming back into my head. Yeah, that's the thing with learning like so many different languages, because I also got to study French growing up in school. And you know, when I was abroad, especially like going into like Turkey and having to learn Turkish and stuff, it's like the last language that you like study keeps coming into your head, you know, like you try to like think of that new word and that new language that you're learning, but the previous language that you learn just keeps coming in. <laughs> so you're just, I don't know, just like jumbled with languages. So I totally understand, you know, that, but you were with your host family though, practicing French and learning more French and then you came back so then what what were your plans then like what were you thinking of doing next so I had um worked my butt off and I had gotten a lot of scholarships and I actually got early admittance into the University of Windsor so I decided to go there and I had two different degrees that I was kind of juggling and I was like okay do I want to go into mathematics because I know I'm good at it but I just fear like it's going to be too hard or do I go into French? And I finally kind of made up my mind. I was like, you know what? I will go as a major in mathematics and a minor in French. So I was offered this um, program that was pretty exclusive to the University of Windsor and it's called the concurrent program. 
So what happens is I was doing my major and minor at the same time that I was doing my education degree. And I had to keep up a certain average in order to maintain my place in the program. And it was extremely competitive. We actually started out with about 20, 25 people in the program. And we ended up with three of us graduating in the concurrent mathematics program. Okay, wow. That sounds pretty competitive, definitely. But, you know, you got in. And so, I mean... Did you do a study abroad program while you were getting your major? Was like still more traveling, like still like in your mind at that time? Uh, no, I, I didn't actually have the opportunity to do a study abroad program just because with my degree, it would have been a lot harder for me. Um, and then in the midst of it, I was originally planning on doing a minor in French, but that got completely messed up along the way. And I actually ended up switching and having two minors in history. And this actually afforded me a lot more opportunities because um, one of my minors was in ancient uh, Greek and Roman civilizations. And I ended up going to Greece with a professor one summer uh, for five weeks. So we did three weeks of touring through like all these museums and uh, different like archaeological dig sites and everything else. And then we ended up doing two weeks of an archaeological dig site ourselves. So that was kind of my first, well, not my first, it was kind of my second trip abroad because the first was to Mexico um, the year before with my dad. But this was my first time kind of being on my own with a group of people and just doing something that I was so passionate about. And being in Greece was amazing. Like it's so beautiful and the people are so nice. And it, even though I ended up getting like severe heat stroke by the end of it, it was such an amazing experience. I was like, I need to do more. I need to see more. Like it just fueled the fire. Yeah. So that, so I guess, like you said, that trip was the trip that was kind of the turning point that you really want to make this more of a, I guess, a lifestyle, would you say? Yeah. For sure. So, I mean, that fueled the fire. And after that, you know, you eventually got your degree. So when was it that you finally had a chance to move to the UK? So I was involved in different organizations. And the one summer I went to both Peru and Egypt to do like volunteer organizations. Like there was one where we built a school kitchen in Peru in like this uh, village in the Amazon. They'd never seen outsiders before in their village. And then I promptly went to Egypt right afterwards to do a volunteer internship on tourism. And that kind of all contributed. I was like, oh my God, I can do this on my own. I can, I can travel. Like I'm so much of an introvert when I'm at home, but I'm so much of an extrovert when I travel. That it was kind of just getting used to that idea and even getting my mom used to the idea. Like my family was like, what are you doing? Uh, this is so weird. Like nobody really travels outside of our community. Nobody really kind of gets out to the real world and out to see all of these things that you're seeing. So I, I was kind of building up to what I really wanted to do, which was move abroad to the UK. So I had this uh, idea kind of early on when I was doing my degree, I was like, you know what, there's not a lot of jobs in Canada. So what should I do to get the experience? And I was like, oh, you know what, maybe I'll just move to the UK for a couple of years and then we'll see what happens. So I can come back. I have that experience. I can skip some of the the steps to get into a per- more permanent position in Canada. But it just kind of spiraled from there. <laughs> I, I totally get it. That's why, you know, things don't always go according to plan. I, I definitely know that bit. So, um, so what was the opportunity that allowed you to move to the UK? I mean, how did you make that happen? transitioning from like leaving Canada to, you know, taking that leap? So um, when I was in university, there was like a career fair for the education department. And almost all of the booths were companies that were recruiting for the UK. Because the UK has such a shortage of teachers, especially like science and mathematics. Um, So they were constantly like trying to recruit you, constantly trying to like pull you in. And uh, I went for an interview with five or six different uh, companies who were recruiting. 
but I finally landed on the one that I chose because when I was in Egypt, there was stuff that went on that I didn't really agree with. I wasn't really supported. So I wanted a company who was going to be there for me if there was any issues whatsoever. And then I ended up getting a position with this company and they said, okay, we have all these schools that are interested in you. So I started interviewing for schools and the one school um, that I ended up going to, Church Need, I had interviews with them and they said like, oh my God, you're perfect for this. Like, um, we really want a female mathematician in our department. Um, if you can move abroad, like right away, we have a house that we can uh, get you a room in, like a house on our campus where we house international teachers and like the rent's cheap and everything else. So that was kind of in the back of my mind. I was like, well, how am I going to get there? How am I going to support myself? How am I going to get everything lined up? Where am I going to live? All this stuff. So that kind of sealed the deal because I was like, you know what? It's right on campus. I don't have to worry about transportation. The rent's pretty cheap. And I started earlier than the school year. So I actually graduated from the university. And two days later, I was on a plane to the UK. Wow. So your life completely changed. And what, what part of the UK was it? So I was situated right outside of Windsor in like a smaller village called Batchett. Okay. All right. So, I mean, you were going from, you know, Canada, like you said, you grew up in a small town. So you grew up in that, and then you moved to a small town to the UK. So do you feel like that was a pretty easy transition? Um, yes and no. Like, um, it was easier than moving into like a bigger city because when I lived in Windsor, I did live in a bigger city, but I always had like support through the residents or through um, my neighbors. Um, And my sister actually lived with me for three years in um, this little wartime house. But I I think I was really comfortable with like kind of the small town mentality still, but there was still teachers. Like I lived with an Irishman uh, for a while there and just so many teachers were from different countries and they were so supportive. They were completely like a family. They took me in and they took care of me. And without them, I don't think I would have transitioned as well as I did. And I totally get that. It really is about like the people that are around you when you make these kind of moves. And especially when it's like other people who are also international, like it makes it so much easier because everyone's just kind of on the same page. Like, oh, you're from this place, you know, I'm from here and you can all kind of connect being in a new place together. Um, which I think is really cool. So, I mean, and then also too, I think what makes it a bit easier is that, you know, in the UK, they do speak English, though there's not really so much a, la- a language barrier, <laughs> you know? So, um, but of course there are a few cultural differences, I guess you would say, but maybe not as drastic as maybe like Vietnam, but did you find anything, did you have any, some sort of culture shock though when you were there or did you feel like it was, you know, pretty much more or less the same as in Canada? I think because it was an English speaking country, my mom was a lot more comfortable with me moving there for sure. But like even walking into the classroom, um, they had teachers from all over the world. But these kids, I started talking and they're like, what? And they would just start like mumbling in their kind of British accent. And it took me about a week to kind of get used to everything. But it was also... It wasn't the culture shock that I was adjusting to. It was the atmosphere in the school. Because when I walked in, the kids did not have any trust, whatever, for new people. All the teachers they had before me had kind of just abandoned them. So they were on a mission to basically drive me out of the school. And I I just remember walking in and being introduced to my department head. And he coming to introduce me to like bringing me to the second in department and just saying, Oh, hi, this is uh, David. David, this is Trisha. Oh, by the way, David's going to hate you. And I was like, what the hell? Like, this is what I'm walking into. It was such just a traumatic first couple weeks because these kids were just like, she's not going to stay. So we're not going to spend any time getting to know her. We're not going to be nice to her. Um, It was, 
just a complete disaster. And I just started questioning myself. I was like, what the hell am I doing here? But in the end, because I'm such a stubborn person, I was like, nope, I signed a two-year contract. I'm here for two years. I'm going to deal with this. And I just did my job and I started winning people over. Like I won the kids over and like even David, who everybody said, oh, he's going to hate you. He's going to hate you. Um, no, he, he was just, he even said to me, I am just so sick and tired of people coming in and not being able to do this job and just being driven out right away. He goes, I'm not going to be friendly to people who aren't going to stick around. So he did start to change and he actually became kind of my rock in that place. So just battling through that was the big adjustment. Um, but like culture shock, not so much besides like eraser versus rubber and stuff like that. Like the kids would always correct me, which I thought was funny. And I would go home and my mom would be like, can you stop st- speaking British now? <laughs> just <laughs> random things I had picked up. I've totally been in your shoes, but yeah, like it's, I've been there in your shoes as well with teaching where you're like in, you know, in a new country, you have a group of students and, you know, you're trying to get their attention. You're trying to, you know, teach and they're making it difficult. And it's one thing to have like the culture where you're living itself being difficult. But I feel like when you do move abroad, it can be the job itself. That could be like the hardest of it all. You know, and especially because when you're there specifically for that job, it's like you really want to make it work because if you make it work, then it makes everything else much better. But I just kind of want to clarify, though, as to why so many teachers before you were leaving, because it was it because the te- or the students were always so hard on them or what was it about that position at that school that made it so difficult that everyone would leave? So I kind of unraveled this throughout my two years there, but um, just the department I was in was very male dominated. And I ended up confronting the head of department at one point and just saying like, that's not appropriate for you to say. Um, He basically called it a good old boys club and said they manage all the females that come through. And I just said to him, you're making this a toxic environment. And you're the reason why this is becoming such a bigger deal than what it needs to be. Like, if you were supportive and welcoming, and I brought so much to that department. And if you ask, like, anyone who worked at the school at the time, they said, yeah, because I ended up bringing in, like, a tutoring program. Um, I ended up helping to support the teachers through like an LGBTQ awareness program because we did have a student who came out as transgender. So I helped with all those transitions and I just felt like I wasn't appreciated as, as like a female teacher. And I, it, the kids are great. They, they were dealing with so many issues as well. Um, I was actually assaulted when I was there and yeah. Um, one of the kids had uh, opposition defiant disorder and I didn't know it was as severe as it was. So we ended up having a confrontation in my classroom. I had bruises on my arms. He ripped apart my desk. He was throwing chairs. Um, There were situations that definitely other people wouldn't have been able to handle that I think I handled pretty well just because in my placements I was placed in rougher schools so I had already broken up fights before I came there but because we were just outside of Windsor you had the kids that were kind of not welcome at more some of the more posh schools so they were kind of placed with us instead and there was a lot of like I don't trust you as a teacher I don't trust what you're trying to do as an adult So you kind of had to win those kids over and work with them. And uh, being that my department was kind of a toxic place, it didn't help with the matters. I totally get it because I've also been in a working teaching environment where it wasn't like the best, especially with like the people like that work there. But that's great that you were able to just stick through it and really did what you could to make it better. And that the fact that you confronted you know, these people that were making it toxic, because I feel like for many other people, they would just kind of give up and be like, you know what, I'm just going to go back home, you know, fly back, you know, I don't need this. But like you said, you know, you're someone who 
was really proud to be there and you really wanted to see your contact contract through. And so by the time you finish your two year contract there, I mean, how would you say things were by the end? So I went there on a youth mobility visa because the company that I was with told me that's the one to get. It's the easiest to get. There's not a lot of paperwork, blah, blah, blah. But it's a one time only two year visa. I was actually willing to go back to the UK. I was willing to keep putting myself in that situation. Um, I just needed to go back to Canada and switch my visa. But in order to switch my visa, I need to be sponsored by the school, which they were unwilling to do. So there was a whole kind of thing where the head of department who I told you about, who was kind of toxic, went behind my back and told the the people who were kind of like in administration that I wasn't coming back just to replace me right away. And one of the first, I think it was one of the first days back actually from school, I was called into the headmaster's office and told point blank, we put your position up for people to apply to because you're not coming back. And I just broke down because I said, I am willing to come back though. I don't know why you were told completely differently because the whole situation was I was taking on the most classes. I had the most hours in our department. And I said, that's the whole reason why I took this class and took that class. And I had to fight because they wanted me to take all the lower level classes. And I said, no, that's really just discouraging. I want some, I want like a top level class and I want like a mid level class. I want to be able to also make a difference in these kids' lives, but you're just giving me all the low-level classes and I have to fight to get anything out of them. And I love them to death, but like it was just so taxing, like mentally taxing. Some of these kids that just were not willing to try, but like other kids, they just wanted someone to believe in them. And I remember one kid he had a U initially in like the mocks and I ended up getting him a level two, which was a real struggle, but like, he was so happy about it. He just wanted somebody to work with him, but it was just so mentally, just completely mentally draining that I just, I fought for the classes that I had. And the fact that they had posted my position without even speaking to me at all, just broke my heart. And, um, David, uh, the second in department, actually tried to fight for me. He's like, when can you get the visa? I, you can come and live at my house. I will move my one son into my other son's room. Uh, he just wanted me to be there so bad because we ended up just depending on each other so much and trying to turn the department around. But it just didn't work out the way that I had hoped. And because this was in like September, my contract didn't end until May. Everybody was telling me, why don't you just leave? Why don't you just take the next step? And I said, I'm not going to just abandon these kids. Like, I'm not willing to do that. So I ended up saying my full contract. And I think the kids really did appreciate it because I did tell them initially, like, my contract's only two years and then we'll see what happens. So at the end of it, it wasn't the greatest situation that I could have been in. and there were people along the way that made that that way, but I just had to deal at the end of it. Yeah. And that, that's the thing is that even though not everything about that was perfect, like, like you said, you wanted to be there for those kids. Like you didn't want to abandon them. Like teachers had before, you know, you wanted to be the one who was different. And that's just the thing. Like sometimes you just really have to figure out or like know why it is that you're there in the first place. And as long as you know why that is, you know, that's going to allow you to push through. And even though it's a circumstance, like you said, it was very difficult. I mean, at least you did what you said you were going to do and you completed the two years that you were there. Yeah, for sure. And like, I I think the kids did appreciate it at the end. Like they did not want me to leave. And this is such a complete and utter turnaround from when I first got there. They were literally begging me. They're like, don't go. And I said to them, like, I... I have to. I don't have a visa. I can't legally stay here. I can't. The position's not open for me anymore. 
And they were just getting so angry, but not at me. They were actually getting angry at like the administration because they're like, how dare they not help you come back? And I just said, there's a lot of politics behind it. I don't want to get into it, but I will always be here for you. Like if you need to reach out, I will be there. And like some of the kids, I do have an open Instagram and some of them like the photos that I I have. And a couple of them have reached out every once in a while just to say hi. And they're, they're absolute sweethearts. Like at the end of the day, they are sweethearts, even though I went through a tough time with some of them. They just want someone to believe in them and be there for them. Exactly. They just want someone to just kind of be a constant for them in their lives. And especially when they haven't always had that. So while this was going on and you knew that you weren't going to be able to, you know, renew your contract. So then what were you thinking at the time to be like your next move? Like, did you start planning early where you were going to go next? Um, yes and no. Like, I just started thinking about it and I was like, I'm not ready to go back to Canada, even though that's kind of what my mom wants. So I kind of got her used to the idea. I was like, no, I'm going to move to a different country. And she's like, oh, God. <laughs> So because I have my international bachelorette, I started looking into international schools in Europe and especially like Thailand and Vietnam, because Thailand, I had just kind of fallen in love with when I was there. And I actually, one of my best friends that I've known since I was like five growing up, she was living in Vietnam at the time. And I had actually visited her for a week um, in 2017. So she (laughs) just kind of started hammering me with, job applications and she's like come here come here uh so that's what ended up happening like I started applying for jobs in Thailand in the UK or not in the UK in Vietnam and one of the schools reached out to me pretty much right away and that ended up being the school that I'm at now Hanoi Academy so I was interviewing for my position while I was working in the UK. And this was a little after Christmas, maybe, because at Christmas, I was just like, what the hell am I going to do? But uh, I was setting up these interviews, and I hemmed and hawed a little bit, but I pretty much accepted right away, because a lot of the other schools either weren't getting back to me right away, or um, it just wasn't quite what I was looking for. So everything was in progress when I was leaving the UK. So when I moved, I ended up stopping off in Iceland on the way back. So I was there for like 10 days. And then I moved back to Canada officially. And I was there for about a month, month and a half, just setting everything up, uh, getting everything ready to move to Vietnam, which I I had been there for a week, but I, it was something I wasn't really familiar with. So it was a completely new experience. Like I was more comfortable throwing myself into moving to the UK than I was to Vietnam. So you had been to Vietnam before for a week, but you know, this time you were actually moving there. And so how was that transition from, I mean, living in a place like the UK to now actually living in Southeast Asia? I mean, you had already been exposed to it before, but what were some things that you were kind of experiencing um, now that you were living there? As soon, like maybe like in the first week that you were there. In the first week, I was just completely terrified. I was questioning everything because I had moved um, two weeks before my friend had moved back. So I was actually living in her apartment, taking care of her cat. And she was trying to, like, support me over Messenger and stuff like that. But it was just so terrifying. And um, I've dealt with anxiety pretty much all my life. But it just kind of skyrocketed. (laughs) So I got... Oh, oh, it was so bad. Like, I was just like, what the hell am I doing? I I had to, like, force myself to go out of the apartment um, just to kind of go to the, the market, which was a completely new thing, like an outdoor market. Mm-hmm. I didn't speak the language like everybody was staring at me I was this big white chick like <laughs> it was so strange but like once I started my induction at the school I I kind of settled in a little bit more I was like okay I can do this there's other new people there's experience the culture as well um, there's other people I can talk to like it, it was just 
connecting with others kind of pulled me out of it. Yeah. And see, and that's the thing, again, it's like, it's always like the people around you that really just makes any situation like a lot better or, you know, worse, like, you know, the school in the UK, you know, but, um, so, I mean, did you start like learning to drive a motorbike? Like, what are some things that you were really kind of immersing yourself in? So learning to drive a motorbike was something I didn't think I was going to do. My friend, since she lived here for over two years, she didn't know how to drive a motorbike. But I'm such a klutz. Like, I've fallen down mountains. I've cut myself cutting, like, a bagel. I've almost cut my finger off. Like, I'm so accident prone that even my mom was like, you're not getting on a motorbike by yourself. It's not going to happen. So I was taking grab everywhere, but I started just to get used to the flow of traffic and get used to what was happening, even though there wasn't like specific traffic rules, there were certain things that everybody kind of followed. So when my friend came back, she took me to a smaller street and she just said, okay, drive. I was like, oh crap, what am I doing? So I ended up getting kind of the feel of the motorbike. She had an automatic. And she took me out a couple more times and I would just like drive up and down these streets and like go in circles and all these Vietnamese men outside like drinking tea would just stare at me and laugh. But um, just being more comfortable with the motorbike really helped. And then my friend said, okay, we're going to go rent a bike. You're going to rent an automatic or you're going to rent a semi-automatic and I'm going to give you my automatic. You're going to get used to it and I'll teach you a semi. I was like, oh, God. (laughs) So (laughs) it was just this, like, fear of, oh, God, what am I doing? What's happening? Yeah, but it's it's fear, but at the same time, it's fine. I mean, it's part of living in Vietnam or just anywhere in Southeast Asia is driving a motorbike. And it's really good that you did have your friend there to kind of not only teach you, but to actually, like, push you to do it, you know? Yeah, for sure. And right now, I'm so comfortable on a motorbike, even though I... I did have two accidents. Um, I didn't get like seriously injured, but I did get pretty bruised up. They were within a week of each other right before Christmas, which is great. But I'm really comfortable on a motorbike now. Like I, I take other people with me. Like I, I have conquered that fear and I'm so glad about it because I'm the type of person when I go traveling, somebody's like, Hey, we're going skydiving. Do you want to go skydiving? And I was like, Oh yeah, sure. Like I'll just throw myself into these random situations, but just conquering that overall fear of the traffic and the motorbike was just great for me. Yeah. And that's how you have to do it. You just have to throw yourself into it because I mean, there's otherwise really no other way <laughs> to learn. Um, so, I mean, you've been there, like you said, for the last you know, 10 months, how would you say you feel now in Vietnam? Do you feel like more so at home? Do you feel like you're still like adjusting? Um, I do feel pretty at home. Uh, I do have a lot more of a support system now. Like I, I have teachers that I'm going traveling with. We're going to like a taco fest today. So I am kind of putting myself out there more, getting to know more people. And I think that's helping me. But yeah, no, it it does feel like home. Like I'm familiar with it and I'm starting to get more familiar with the language. It's so hard to learn because there's like tones. And if you say the slightly wrong tone, it's a completely different meaning. Um, This poor kid in my homeroom. So his name is Wu, but I was calling him Wu. And without the tone, without the proper tone, I was calling him bra for the first week. Oh, no. (laughs) But he didn't correct me. He's he's such a kind kid. He was just like, okay, yeah, sure. He <laughs> he didn't even think about it. But I was like, dude, just correct my pronunciation. I don't want to be calling you bra for the whole year. No, I mean, bless them. Because I know sometimes, too, when I would try to say, you know, a name, whether it's Vietnamese or Chinese, you know, whatever. And, like, I know I'm pretty, I'm, I'm like, I think I'm saying them right. But like every time there was like, yeah, that's fine. And I'm like, is it though? Is it really? Because it still doesn't sound exactly how they would say it, you know? But I mean, I feel like they do just appreciate the effort. They do. And like, because my voice is so much lower than some of the Vietnamese people I come across, like even my teacher's like, no, you have to say it with a higher voice. And I was like, I don't have a higher voice though. <laughs> so... <laughs> 
it's just trying to adjust to like the tones and everything else. And they do appreciate it, but sometimes they do just kind of giggle at you and just like gesture to something. You're like, yeah, okay, I tried. Yeah, and that's all you really can do. And especially like whatever you're doing overseas, whether it's like learning a language or driving a motorbike or going skydiving, you need you should just try it. But it seems like, you know, in Vietnam, it's definitely was an easier transition for you because, you know, you did have a friend there that was able to kind of show you around. So how has it been, you know, not just living abroad, but how has it been for you, like traveling and wise? Have you been doing a lot of solo trips or do you just meet people along the way and you're doing like more trips together? How has that been? Um, so I was so used to solo traveling when I was in the UK, I did a lot of Europe and everything else. Um, now I have only been on a couple trips, but they've usually been with the, the friend that's showing me around Sam, but, um, I did do a solo trip to New Zealand over Tet and then I stopped off in Singapore as well. So I am used to solo traveling. I'm used to meeting people along the way. Um, this summer has been kind of been weird just because I was supposed to go back to Canada and then I was planning on stopping on different at different countries along the way but um now I'm the borders are closed so I'm stuck in Vietnam and because I was completely alone during like the lockdown and everything else like we shut down as soon as I came back from Tet so the beginning of February I ended up working from home pretty much the start of March So March, April, I was completely alone in my house. Like I was the only one I interacted with and I did go a little stir crazy. Um, Luckily, we did go back to school the start of May. So I did have other people to talk to. But now I just find that I'm craving um, company. I'm craving other people just to interact with more than I want want to solo travel just at the moment. Yeah. And I think just because, yeah, since you were kind of forced to be on your own, now it's like, okay, you want to do something a little different, which you know, includes interacting with other people. You know, since you've done so many like solo travel trips on your own, how would you say that's been for you, especially like as a woman, like going like around Europe and New Zealand, like how has that experience been? Um, it's been great for me. There's been like points in time where I, I almost had um, stuff pickpocketed from me. Like I've had confrontations with different males just thinking they, because I'm traveling alone, like I'm an easier target. But overall, because I'm, I'm a very tall woman and I'm, I'm a pretty like big build. So I, I do tend to kind of walk very confidently, very straight, like I know where I'm going. Um, there's just tricks that you kind of have to employ as a solo woman traveler, just constantly being aware of your surroundings, um, having kind of that escape plan, being aware of are people staring at you, are people kind of approaching you that look shady or whatever. Um, I haven't had anything happen, thank God, but you just need to be so completely aware just because I am a woman, but I know that uh, other people have it so much worse. Like people of color have to deal with the racism coming from different countries, Uh, women of smaller build or women who look like they can't really defend themselves. Um, Like I've had people in my group uh, be sexually assaulted before or sexually harassed. And it's, it's horrible. Like, I don't understand why people think that they can just do that to just random people on the street. I I mean, I've definitely been one of those victims as well. And it actually, it happened in Hanoi like twice um, where someone grabbed me and someone actually like waited for me and had his hand out to try to grab me while I was driving. And the thing is, it happened not even in the middle of the night. It happened like, Yes, it happened around 9.30 p.m., but, like, on a very busy road. And that and that's the thing. Like, people always assume, oh, like, don't go out late at night. It's like, it happens, like, whenever. No, completely. And, like, even there was so many posts on the different, like, grab and be and all this other stuff. Women, you must dress appropriately um, not to be grabbed. And I'm like, that's not, that's not the message you should be sending, though. Like, 
it, it doesn't matter how you're dressed. It doesn't matter. Like it, it matters what the person is doing. Why aren't these drivers being fired? Why aren't there more consequences? But it's, there's, yeah, I, there's some things I don't agree with, um, especially in this country. Like there's more domestic abuse, especially towards women and just like victim blaming. And I, I hate that. Um, I stand up wherever I can. Like I've actually had students ask me about kind of social issues and I have been honest with them and I have tried to educate them. Like um, I have friends who identify as LGBTQ and even that here is just such like a strange concept. So bringing that into the classroom, I think is really important. Just making people aware that it's it's not okay to behave like this, but also there's all kinds of different experiences. There's um, people of color have a completely different experience than I do. I'm a white woman with like blonde hair, so I I don't get the amount of comments or whatever that other people could. But educating these kids about what's out there and the different uh, genders and experiences and races and I feel like that's so important because they really don't get that. No. And especially too, because now it's a time where, you know, globalization is such a big thing. People are traveling, people are living internationally. And so, you know, they're going to be exposed to all these different kinds of people, you know, of like different like races and ethnicities and everything. And so I agree. It's definitely important that they learn and understand the different kind of people that there are in the world so that we can like prevent like these like kind of judgments and like these assumptions about these people that, you know, aren't true or just trying to show like how we are all equal, but just everyone, you know, is a bit different, but that's okay. But it needs to happen more in the classroom. And that's another benefit about having an international teacher coming in is to just kind of show students, you know, different things that they probably wouldn't learn if it was just a teacher from their own country. Even just talking about different experiences while traveling or talking about the people I know back home, there's so many questions that they have that they feel like they can't ask their parents or they can't ask people who they grew up with. And when I started talking just casually about my friend who he lives with his boyfriend, they were just all completely shocked. And they're like, what? how is that a thing? Like, why, why are you so accepting? And I was like, why wouldn't I be accepting? He's a person too. We're all the same on the inside. So just being exposed to that, I feel like the kids that I'm teaching, at least they're, they're a little bit more open and willing to understand versus some of like the older Vietnamese generation and stuff like that. Yeah. And I noticed that too, when I was there, um, that, that, because they're exposed to, I would say, like more international teachers, just because they're in an international school or they do after school programs with, you know, international teachers, you know, I just feel like they just ha- naturally have that curiosity, you know, to just kind of learn more and be and ask like more questions. And especially because there is the internet and they see things and they kind of want to follow up on that a little bit more, which, which is how it should be. And, um, but yeah, like Hanoi, like, well, Vietnam in general, like you said, like there are great things about like the country, but of course there's so much change that still needs to happen, but not just there, but I feel like everywhere. But it seems like you said, like, you know, it does feel like home and you're just doing what you can to just educate and make the most of your time there. But what would you say is the country that you would say that you maybe had the most incidences, like kind of negative ones? Would you say you had any? Um unfortunately Egypt but it was kind of just a buildup of I mentioned earlier the organization I went with was not very supportive at all at one point because I was there for like tourism we were all over the country and at one point I was in Cairo and I got a call um your apartment door has been broken we we took all your stuff out I was like okay well where is my stuff where is my laptop and they they refused to tell me. And it was such just, I, I'm not used to feeling that way. But because I was a woman, it was basically like, you don't deserve to know this. Don't worry about it. The males will take care of you. And I was like, no, that's not, that's not acceptable. 
and I'm, I'm very vocal and um, I know how to take care of myself. And that was actually the place where somebody in my group was sexually assaulted. And I felt so bad for her. But there were so many different ethnicities there. And um, they all kind of looked up to me because I, I was kind of, I tend to be the mother hen, as people have called me. So I tend to kind of look after everybody, make sure everything's okay. And I had one of the little Chinese girls come up to me afterwards and basically said, like, how do I protect myself? So I was, it's such a horrible conversation to have, but I feel like you kind of need to have that conversation of like, how do I protect myself from these things happening? You know, you do, you need to, like you said, like being just like alert and be aware because I feel like the moment you let your guard down, that's. It, it's not like something will, but most likely something can happen. And, and it's a shame that as women, we always have to think like that. But I mean, like, that is the reality. You need to always kind of think a little, like at least one step ahead, if not a few steps. Well, that's the thing you always kind of have to have in your mind. If something happens right now, what am I going to do? Where are the exits? Where am I going to go? Who is going to be willing to help me? Um, and I, I don't want to think like that, but you, you have to, it's unfortunate, but you have to, like, even growing up in Canada, it was basically, I lived in an area when I was in university that was not the greatest area to live in. Like, I just remember the one day there was a police tank rolling down my street for, I don't know even what reason, but it was there. And you just always have to think, okay, if somebody comes up behind me, what am I going to do? How are they going to grab me? So just keeping those things in the back of your head, it's awful, but you, you have to do it. Yeah. And then also too, when I, you know, was like assaulted in Hanoi, it was like, it happened on my motorbike. And after that, I kept thinking, how am I going to protect myself on a motorbike? You know, like, especially because I was driving an automatic and I was trying to figure out like, how would I protect myself if someone tried to grab me again? And like I said, it's like, it's something that we shouldn't have to think about, but like it happens. And at the end of the day, I just feel like you can't let it stop you, of course, from letting you do what you want to do. And I think that's why there's just some people that don't kind of go for these kind of experiences because they're always thinking of like the negative and where it's like, yeah, like those things can happen, but you can't let that stop you from living the life you want. Even most of my travels, there's been something that happens right before. And then my mom gets so scared. Before I went to Greece, like a couple days before, the bank shut down. So we had to deal with that. Um, before Peru, it was the Zika virus. Before Egypt, it was the Egypt air hijacking. Before the UK, it was the attack on the bridge. Um, there's so many things that happen that are out of your control. And I just basically said to my mom, I'm not going to let that stop me. I know what I want to do. I know who I am and I'm going to go for it. There's some people who just kind of let that fear of what if stop them. And I just basically said, no, you know what? I'm going to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And I'm not going to let that stop me. I'm going to take precautions, of course, but I'm not going to let that completely just stop me from doing what I want to do and living out my dream and exploring and just experiencing everything that the world has to offer. Like there's been so many things that I've checked off my bucket list. Like I said, like skydiving, bungee jumping. Um, I've gone scuba diving. I don't have my license just yet, but that's on the list of stuff to do. Why would I let that stop me when I only have one life to live? I, I don't have another chance to do this. And also too, it's just about like kind of just being, you know, educated, like doing your research and stuff, because I feel like once you like do a bit of research and like learn more about what you're getting yourself into, then you know what precautions to take, but, you know, still moving forward with what you want to do. And um, yeah, like I agree, like we have one life to live. And if you don't do this now, then I mean, what are you going to, when are you going to do it? You know, so I want to say I truly appreciate, you know, your time and, you know, sharing your story. But I always ask this to everyone. So for someone that wants to move abroad and live this kind of life, I mean, what is one bit of advice that you would give them? Um, 
I think like do your research for sure, but honestly, just go for it. Because once you put yourself in a situation where you're uncomfortable, you're more likely to kind of seek out different experiences, different cultures, because just the the willingness to learn and be open is so important when you're traveling and when you're moving abroad. Just being open to everything, being open to people, being open to cultures, languages, experiences, anything that happens is so important. And even if it's uncomfortable, there's going to be so many positives. Like the the people I met back in the UK, they are like family. And honestly, I, I would be willing to go visit them. And I know any one of them would, would put me up. And even though there is uncomfortable situations and that kind of stands out, there are so many positives to all of these experiences as well. Just do it, honestly. Yes, just do it. But also, I just I just want to touch on that just like one more time, because you have been through so many uncomfortable situations, like from, like you said, like, you know, when you went to, you know, Egypt, and then from when you first moved abroad to the UK, working at the school where it was a bit toxic, and it was a bit uncomfortable, but you still push through that and you still made it the best situation that you could. And that has still allowed you to see the world the way you want to. And now has you living in, you know, Vietnam, you know, which is amazing. So I guess another question, my last question, what what do you see for yourself for the next year or like after Vietnam? So I'm here for another year in Vietnam, for sure. That's the contract I've signed. I'm not sure what I'm going to do next. I have had companies try to recruit me for the UK again or even like New Zealand. I've had a couple come through for Australia. Um, I'm just not sure because I think it all just kind of depends on what I'm feeling in that moment or leading up to that moment of my contract ending. Um, Is it the best decision to stay or is it the best decision to move on and keep going with all of my adventures? But nevertheless, wherever I end up, I'm still going to be traveling. I'm still going to be just doing as much as I possibly can because, like I said before, I only have one life. So why would I sit at home in the middle of nowhere and just not experience what I want to experience? I know I agree. Instead of being at home dreaming and wishing, you might as well just be doing, you know? So thank you again so much for your time. Your story is great. It's, it's inspiring. And I really, yeah, I definitely hope that more women, you know, do what you do and, you know, sit through the uncomfortable of these situations and go and live the life that they want to live. So I'm glad that you've been able to push through and, you know, get to where you are now. So I'm really excited to see what happens next for you. But I just want to say thank you again so much for your time. I truly appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. For more information on travel and life abroad, go to Venturet.com. If you enjoyed this episode, let me know by leaving a review. And be sure to follow me at Venturet on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Safe travels, and until next time.